In this section, we're going to look at the matrix of a linear transformation. So if you recall, a linear transformation is this special kind of mapping that has two properties. Uh, to say it succinctly, they preserve vector addition and they preserve scalar multiplication. Okay, in that if you add vectors and then transform them, you get the same thing as if you transformed each one and then added them. And then if you multiply by a scalar inside before doing the transformation, it's going to give you the, the same as if you multiplied the scalar after you did the transformation. So what we're going to look at is how to rewrite these. Now, if you remember from the last section, we said in order for a linear transformation to exist, we're going to be we're going to have our input be a vector. Now, I chose a vector from R3 here, but it could be a vector from R2 or R4 or wherever. So just because it has three entries, I don't think they always have to have three entries, obviously. So we took a vector, our input vector, and our output vector has to have each entry as a function of variables from our input vector. And that function, each of these, has to be linear and without constants. So linear, and then we can't have like a plus 5 constant at the end or anything like that. So it's going to have to look like this. Now, I chose A's, B's, and C's, but you could choose any letters you want. So it's going to, if our input is um, a three-dimensional vector and our output is a three-dimensional vector, then this is what it's going to have to look like. Okay, we're going to have x1, x2, x3. So in essence, a linear combination of x1, x2, x3 as numbers. A linear combination of x1, x2, x3 as numbers in our second spot. And a linear combination of x1, x2, x3 in our third spot. Again, no variables, or excuse me, no constant numbers um, other than the coefficients. Now, I want you to think about what the resulting matrix would be if I took A1, A2, A3, and B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3, and multiplied it by this three-dimensional vector. In fact, I want you to just push pause on the video and go ahead and do that yourself. All right, so hopefully you uh, went ahead and did that. I just mean, did the multiplication, I sorry, of this matrix times this vector. If you do that, you see that the output is going to be exactly the same as the linear transformation I wrote in that previous slide. Okay, so this linear transformation has the same output as this matrix multiplication. Uh, I just want to go show you how to do that real quick if, if you have forgotten. So what we do is we take this first column, we'd write that as a vector times x1. The second column, we'd write that as a vector times x2. Third column, we'd write that as a vector times x3. And then when you add this up, this would be a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2 plus a3 times x3. That would be your first entry. b1 times x1 plus b2 times x2 plus b3 times x3 would be, oops, would be your second entry. And then again, c1 times x1, c2 times x2, c3 times x3 would be your third entry. All right. So you'd get the matrix again. That was the output matrix of an arbitrary linear transformation. Okay, from, again, that linear transformation was from R3 to R3. 
But what this shows you is that every linear transformation is actually can be thought of as a matrix transformation. In other words, if we're from Rn to Rm and T is a transformation, then there is some matrix that would give you the same result as the transformation on any arbitrary vectors. So in other words, the transformation times an arbitrary vector is going to give you the exact same thing as the matrix multiplied times the vector. So for every tr linear transformation, for every linear transformation, there is a unique matrix that the linear transformation applied to any vector is going to give you the same result as that matrix multiplied times the vector. Okay. By the way, the proof is basically just this. We just say, well, how big of a matrix do you want from R what to R what? And then say, well, because each entry in our output vector is a linear function without a constant, we can create that by taking the linear functions as you know, basically this uh, a1, a2, a3, this row times our vector. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So I want you to do this. Try to find a matrix such that if, if you have this linear transformation that's defined here, such that that transformation times any vector is A times that vector. So try to find the matrix that's associated with this linear transformation. Push pause on the video and see if you can go ahead and do that. All right, so hopefully you did that. Um, basic idea here is that we want to create a matrix that has the same output. So I'm thinking of a matrix A, which when you multiply it times the vector x1, x2, x3 gives us this. Now, if you remember from last time, what's going to happen is that x1 is going to have to be multiplied times the first column x2 is going to have to multiply by the second column. x3 is going to have to be multiplied by the third column. That tells me that there's going to be three columns in our matrix because I need to multiply by x1, x2, x3. And because my output vector has just two rows, I know my matrix A is going to be two rows and three columns. It's going to be this big. All right. Now I know that x1 is going to have to be multiplied by the first column. So all I have to do is go over here and say, okay, x1 is multiplied by 5 in the first row and negative 1 in the second row. x2 is multiplied by a negative 2 in the first row. In the second row, there's no x2, so we'll just label that as 0. And then lastly, we have a 6 and a 4 as my coefficients of x3 that are in the first and second row, respectively. So the matrix A that I'm looking for, the matrix that I'm looking for is 5, negative 2, 6, negative 1, 0, 4. Okay? And it's a pretty straightforward process. Anytime you have this, all you have to do is, again, first column is going to be your x1s, second column is going to be your x2s, third column is going to be your x3s, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the matrix that we wanted, oops, let me do this, we would say that matrix A, the one we were looking for, must have been that. 
All right. So that's the that's the big idea. And if you have a transformation that's defined this way, then it's a pretty nice, um, easy process to actually find the matrix that defines that linear transformation, or the I should say the the matrix which is associated with that transformation. Now, we're going to look at another way to talk about finding the matrix, but that other way is going to need some terminology. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what's called the identity matrix. All right. The identity matrix is going to be an N by N matrix. We call that a square matrix when the number of rows and columns are the same. So it's going to be a square matrix, n by n, with ones on the diagonal, technically the main diagonal, and zeros elsewhere. Okay, so if we have ones on the upper left, working ourselves to the lower right, and it's a square matrix, that's called the identity matrix. We saw a lot of these when we put things into row reduced echelon form. Okay. I don't think I used the term identity matrix, but that's what it was. So when we put things in a row reduced echelon form, we have the identity matrix. Now the subscript here, the N, is just how big it is. So I sub 2 is a 2 by 2 identity matrix. I sub 3 is a 3 by 3 identity matrix. We could have I sub 5. That would be a 5 by 5 identity matrix. Now, the identity matrix itself isn't the most important part of this chapter, uh, or excuse me, of this section. The identity matrix is useful in that we want to look at the columns, right? These are really nice columns. They have a 1 in a certain spot and zeros elsewhere. A 1 in a certain spot, zeros elsewhere. Those types of rows and columns are really nice to deal with when we're talking about row reduced echelon form, but they're also really nice to deal with when we're talking about multiplying matrices. All right. So we're going to create what we call E1, E2, E3, E4, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And basically, those are just the column vectors in our identity matrix, okay? So E2 stands for having a 1 in the second entry and zeros elsewhere. E3 stands for having a 1 in the third entry and zeros elsewhere. E1 has a 1 in the first entry and zeros elsewhere. E16 would have a 1 in the 16th entry and zeros elsewhere if we were in a big enough dimension where E16 existed. All right. So you can see that in R3, if you only have three dimensions, then there's only going to be three E's. If we were in R4, there would be four E's. Pretty straightforward. Okay, now what we can do, or one way to think about the transformations, is ask what does the transformation do to E1, E2, E3? What does it do to those column vectors in our, our identity matrix? So let's calculate what those things are, and then show how that's related to the matrix we found earlier. So just as a reminder, our transformation is here. And last time we did this, we kind of logically just said, oh yeah, these have to be the coefficients and uh, so on and so forth. And that's where we found A. But I want you to notice what's going to happen when we put in, oops,
the vector 1, 0, 0. Now, I'm not going to write uh, this every time, but I will the first time. Think about what's going to happen to our output vector. Everywhere I see an x1, it's going to be replaced with a 1 that I'm multiplying. Every time I see an x2, it's going to re be replaced with a 0. Every time I see an x3, it's going to be replaced with a 0. So basically, what's going to happen is that the terms with the x2s and x3s are going to go away. And by inputting 1, 0, 0, the only thing we have left are essentially just the coefficients of the terms with the x1s. All right, so we basically are ending up with a 5, negative 1. So what that tells me is that, again, remember what matrix we had earlier, we found 5, negative 1 was our first column. So if we input E1, we got the first column of our matrix. Now, I'm not going to do this long form every time, but it's pretty obvious that if we input E2, scroll up, All that's going to be left, the terms with the x1 and the terms with the x3 are going to go away. The only thing that will remain is the coefficients of the x2 terms. And so we get the second column in our matrix. And without uh, doing the calculations, you can imagine that when you plug in E3, you end up with the third column of my matrix A. All right. Now, you can see why that has to be the case, right? No matter what dimensional spaces we're in, this was not a fluke. Every time you're dealing with a linear combination, if you plug in one of the E's, let's say you plugged in E2, it's going to give you all the coefficients of the X2 and none of the coefficients of X1 or X3. If, you plugged, if we were in a five-dimensional space and you plugged in E4, you'd get all of the coefficients of the X4 in an arbitrary vector. So this tells us if I don't have a transformation explicitly defined for me, if I know where the transformation sends E1 and E2 and E3 and so on and so forth, I can, I can find a matrix that describes that transformation. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to take this and figure out a matrix so that the transformation multiplied times a vector, or the transformation of a vector is the same as the matrix multiplied times the vector. Now, here's what I want you to note. We're going to start in R2. So we're going to start in R2. We're going to have an E1 and an E2. Again, think two by two identity matrix. And I'm going to get out a vector in R3. So you can see those two vectors there. All right. Push pause on the video and see if you can do that. This is not a hard or difficult uh, situation. Again, once you get the hang of it. Um, let's go ahead and do this example. 
So basically, I want a matrix that when I multiply times 1, 0, I get 4, negative 2, 3. Now, if you multiply any matrix times 1, 0, it's just going to pull off the first column. So in essence, that first column, well, first off, notice since we're going from R2, since our, we're multiplying by a vector from R2, we're going to have two columns. And since we're getting in, in vectors from R3, getting out vectors is output vectors from R3, we're going to have three rows. So when we create this, it's going to be a 3 by 2 matrix. When you multiply times 1, 0, it's going to pull off the first column. So basically, it just says my first column is going to be 4 negative 2, 3. Same thing over here, but we're going to pull out our second column. So the second column is going to be negative 1. Oops, I'm sorry. I mistook, mistook that. I put E1 instead of E2 I'm in my notes there. So 0, 1, you pull off the second column when you multiply times E2. So there you go. So it's pretty obvious that the matrix has to have the first column as 4, negative 2, 3, and the second column as negative 1, 5, 9. And there we go. All right, so that's your matrix A. I want you to do the same thing for the next example. So push pause on the video and hopefully I'll move that slide just slightly down. There you go. So push pause on the video and go through and figure out, find a matrix that, so such that matrix multiplication by X is equivalent to the transformation of X. All right, in this case, we're going to go from R4 to R3. All right, hopefully you did that. All right, so hopefully you uh, went ahead and did that and got it. Now, let me just go through it um, in a fairly quick way. When we're creating this matrix, I'm not going to go all through the things. But basically, we're going to have an E1, an E2, an E3, and an E4. That means we're going to have four columns. And since our outputs are all in R3, that means we're going to have three rows. Okay. So my matrix is going to have four columns and three rows. It's going to be a three by four matrix. And E1 is going to, my image of E1 is going to determine my first column. My image of E2 is going to determine my second column. My image of E3 is going to determine my third column. And my image of E4 is going to determine my fourth column. Okay? So the matrix that we're looking for is this matrix here. 3, 7, 2, negative 4, 1, negative 1, 2, 2. 1, 2, 3, 6. All right? So that's the uh, matrix that we were looking for. All right. So... The other thing we can do with this is we can start to use this fact of the transformation is linear to find images of other vectors. Okay. Now there's a couple of different ways you can go about this. I will uh, I'll kind of show you both um, on this example. But uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's it. I'll show you both on this example. 
All right. So let's go to the Word document here. And we're going to find t of 6, 1. OK. Now, the key, th the key uh, things we're using here is that if I take a t and I apply it to u plus v, I could have said, well, that's t of u. Whoops. t of u plus t of v. And then also, we know that t of cu is equal to c of tu, where u and v is their vectors and c is a constant. Okay, Those are my two properties of linear transformations. So we can utilize those directly and figure out what the image of 6, 1 is. All right, so this is sort of technique one. Use the properties of linear transformations that we know to find the image. Okay, so here's what I would do. I would take t of 6, 1, and I would write t of, uh, excuse me, I would write 6, 1 as a linear combination of two vectors, specifically vectors E1. And just to remind you of what E1 was, E1, since we're in two-dimensional space, E1 was 1, 0. And 0, 1. E2. So we want to write 6, 1 as a linear combination of 1, 0 and 0, 1. Now that's pretty easy to do. All we have to do is take 6 times E1 plus 1 times E2. Okay? Now, you can call that 1, 0. You can call that E2. It doesn't matter which way you do that. If you would rather use the terminology E1 and E2, or if you would rather use the, the actual numerical values. But that's what's happening. Now, because of this first property, what I can do is I can break that up and I can say, well, that's actually equal to t of 6 times e1 plus t of 1 times e2. OK, so the first property gives me that that you can break this over the sum. The second property says, well, you can pull out the scalars. And so it is 6 times t of e1. I know I haven't made those bold yet, but that's OK. Plus 1 times t of e2. All right. Now we know what whoops. Now we know what uh, t does to e1 gives me 2 negative 1. We know what t does to e2 gives me 3 4. And so I can replace t of e1 with exactly what it is. The image of so we can go 6 times The vector, again, 2, negative 1. Plus 1 times the vector 3, 4. Again, I'm getting that because 3, 4 is the image 
after you've hit it with T with the transformation T. And now it's just a matter of computing with using vector addition and scalar multiplication. So our resulting vector is going to be what you get when you take, well, let me point things out first as I'm doing it, 6 times 2 plus 1 times 3. So that's a 12 plus 3 gives me 15. And negative 6 plus 4 gives me negative 2. So without even having to go through um, figuring out lots of things. Basically, if you know what a transformation does to E1 and E2, and if we were in R3, you'd go, if you know what it does to E1 and E2 and, N, and E3, then you know what it does to any vector, because you can write any vector as a linear combination of E1, E2, E3. Okay, remember E1 is just basically giving you a first entry of 1 and zeros elsewhere. So it's fairly easy to write any vector as a linear combination of E1s and E2s and E3s and so on and so forth. Because the first entry is just going to be, again, first entry here is 6. So when I write a linear combination, it's going to be 6 times E1. Second entry is 1, so linear combination is going to be 1, E2. If you had a third spot, whatever was in that third spot would be plus whatever was in that third spot times E3. Okay? So we can use the, the linear transformation properties to figure that out. Now, the other method doesn't use linear transformation properties. The other method basically just says, well, let's find the matrix, and then let's compute T of 6, 1 by taking the matrix times E1. So it goes like this. Start by noticing that the matrix that I'm going to get, it's going to go from R2 to R2, so it's going to be 2 by 2. When I multiply the trans, excuse me, when I take the transformation times E1, that's like multiplying the matrix times E1, so that's going to pull off my first column. When I multiply the matrix times E2, I'm going to get the same thing as taking the transformation of E2. So that's going to pull off my second column. So that's the matrix A. And now, since I know that A times any vector is going to be the same result as the transformation of any vector, I can take A and I can multiply it times the vector 6, 1, and get out some answer. Whoops. So when you take A times 6, 1, um, I guess I'll write the whole thing right now. 6 times the vector Two negative one. My apologies, I'm writing bad today. So two negative one times six plus one multiplied times the vector three four. And again, it's fairly obvious that we are getting the exact same result in either case. We're getting the vector which has a 15 in the first entry and a negative 2 in the second entry. Alright, so 
Either way is fine with me if you'd rather use the method of utilizing properties of linear transformations. You can break down that way. If you would rather utilize finding the matrix and then doing matrix multiplication, you can do it that way. Notice that in either case, you get 6 times the image of E1 plus 1 times the image of E2. And both methods ended up with that line there. Okay, so that's the important thing. So what I'd like you to do is we're going to use the same transformation, but find the image of negative 2, 3 under that transformation. Again, it's a transformation from R2 to R2. All right, it's going to look very, very similar. Whoops. Except now we're going to use negative 2, 3. So if your transformation starts, applies, hits negative 2, 3, all I have to know is that my, I'm going to skip this step. So all I have to know is that I'm, I can break the transformation up since it's linear. That transformation applied to E1 times negative 2 plus the transformation applied to E2 times 3 is going to give me my result. And we just use different numbers than we had last time, but the same concept. Negative 2 times 2 is negative 4 plus 3 times 3 is 9. That's giving me out a 5. If I've calculated that right, negative 4 plus 9 is 5. And then negative 2 times negative 1, that's a positive 2, plus 3 times 4. So 2 plus 12 gives me 14. All right. So you could have done it that way. You could have also... done the matrix way. Find the matrix, we already found it in the last example, and then multiply times negative 2, 3. And so you get the, in either case, we're getting the exact same thing. We're getting the, that when you take negative 2, 3, hit it with the transformation, you're going to get out a 5, 14. Another way to say that is that the image of negative 2, 3 under transformation T is 5, 14. So though that's sort of a, a nice way to use those E's. Okay, again, these are what are going to be called elementary vectors. I'm not going to mess with those, but that mess with the names until later. But what we call E sub 1, E sub 2 in this class will always be those vectors. A 1 or a, a 1 in entry 1 and zeros elsewhere. When I'm talking about E1, when I'm talking about E2, that's always going to be a 1 in the second entry and zeros elsewhere. All right, so we found the image of negative 2, 3 under that transformation. Now, one thing we want to get into is we want to look at some different types of transformations. Specifically, we want to characterize transformations that are what's, what's called onto and transformations which are one-to-one, -one. okay? 
So let's start with the idea of onto. We're going to have a transformation that goes from Rn to Rm. So Rm is my codomain. The transformation is onto if every vector in my codomain is the image of at least one vector from my domain. All right? Another way to say onto is that the range is your codomain. Okay? So every vector in Rm can be formed as a um, as an image of some vector from the domain. Okay? So we can hit every vector we want in my codomain. Now, a mapping or a transformation is one to one if when you find a vector in your range or let's say for every vector in your codomain is the image of at most one vector in our domain. Okay, so this is at least one vector. This is at most one vector. Okay, so here's the one-to-one. -one. What one-to-one -one basically means is that if you, there's no two vectors which are going to map to the same vector. All right, so one-to-one -one means that if you were drawing this, if you had, for instance, a U and a V in your domain, and they both mapped to your vector B, that would be not one-to-one. -one. All right, not, this is bad, one. Sometimes one to one, we shorthand is one dash one or one T O one. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of transformations and we're going to decide if they're on to, if every vector can be hit, and if it's one to one, if every vector that can be hit is the image of at most one vector in my domain. Okay. So let's take this matrix for example, A. You can see the matrix there. We're going to see if it's one to one and we're going to determine if the transformation is on to as well. Now, the way to do this is to use techniques that we saw earlier and connect it to some of the ideas that we saw earlier. So the technique that I'm talking about that we did earlier um, is thinking about, again, what one-to-one -one means, what onto means. So think about what one-to-one -one means in a matrix equation. Or to me, I'm sorry, think about what onto means in terms of a matrix equation. So we have this matrix here, A. Now, onto means that for every B that you can think of in the codomain, it's going to have an image. So what that means is there's going to be a solution to this equation for every B you can think of. Now, we actually did that same type of problem earlier, and all we have to do is put A into row-reduced echelon form, and then think through what kind of solutions we could get, what kind of, um, what kind of answers we would have. So this is where we would turn to our calculator and go into row-reduced echelon form mode after you've plugged in a matrix. 
So we're going to take a matrix. Our matrix is 3 by 4. And our entries were 1, 5, 6, 4, 5, 7, 9, 6, 1, 1, 0, oh, 9. Okay, so that's our matrix A. Hopefully I typed that in right. I think I did, so we'll quit. Go into the matrix menu one more time. Math, row reduce echelon form. We're going to row reduce echelon form the matrix A. And this is what it looked like. All right. Now, the key thing is that remember, we're talking about the equation AX equals B for all Bs. So, what I would have done is I've left off the column over here to the right of all the constants. But no matter what this column over here to the right would have been, I'm saying like um, if we had an augmented matrix, we'd ha we would have had to add another column. So whatever that column would have been, we could have found answers. All right, no matter what that would be. Because each row has a pivot position. So we could have found answers. In fact, we could have found infinitely many answers for pretty much each B that we choose. All right? So in this case, since we can find a solution, we can, oops, can find a solution for every B. We know the transformation is on to. Okay. So that's it. Let me unbold that. And there we go. Okay, so this is on to. Now think about what one to one means. All right, means that if we have a solution, there is only one. If we have a solution, to the equation AX equals B, then there is only one such solution. So the key here If there's one solution, then there can only be one. There can't be multiples. All right. Now, what does the row reduce form of our matrix indicate? Well, it indicates that there's going to be an infinite number of solutions no matter what these Bs are. Okay, this column here represents a free variable, which represents infinitely many solutions. So when we row reduced, we can find infinitely many solutions for some B. So the transformation is not one to one. Hopefully that makes sense. So infinitely many solutions, therefore not one to one. OK. 
Okay, so this matrix transformation, this transformation that was represented by this matrix, I should say, was onto because you could get every B, but was not one to one because there were infinitely many ways to get to some Bs. All right. Should not have bolded that, maybe. I don't know. So I would like you to try, think through this next problem on your own, push pause on the video, and see if this, the transformation with this associated matrix is one to one and whether this transformation is on to. All right, hopefully you went ahead and did that. Okay. Um so basically uh we'll do on to first. If you did one to one first it's fine. But we're gonna say is there a solution to this matrix equation for every B that you can think of. Again, think augmented matrix. We'll have another column here. I took the matrix A and threw it in my calculator. When you put it into row reduced echelon form, watch this, it's going to give you an invalid dimension. We've done that before. So what does that mean? That means we have to add in a dummy column. Hopefully you remember that. Because I have more uh, columns than rows, our calculator for some reason doesn't like that. You can still sort of get around that fact by just throwing in that dummy column. But what you'll see is that, again, ignore this last column, you get ones on the diagonal, but you also have this row of zeros. And if we had a last column here, we could put a one and get a no solution case. So there are cases here because we could end up with zero on the last row equaling one. There are cases, there are situations where there would be a B such that it'd be a no solution. So there are, whoops, vectors, the Bs specifically, that have no solution and therefore the transformation is not on to. We'll go capitalize that. Not, not on to. So that's it. That's basically it. Now, is it one to one? Okay. One to one says if you have a solution, there's only one such solution. If you go back to this matrix, again, this this uh, last column, don't throw, think of that, kind of pretend we erase that last column. So we have three columns. Each one has a pivot position. There are no free variables. No free variables means that every time there is a solution, we only get one solution, or we only get one answer. Only get one answer when the equation ax equals b is solvable. All right. And therefore, the transformation 
is one to one. All right. So there, if there is an answer, there's no free variables. Again, forget that last column. That was the dummy column. No free variables. So only one solution every time there is a solution. Now, there's going to be um, vectors that there's no solutions. We saw that, but that doesn't affect it. That does not affect one-to-one. -one. Okay, one-to-one -one is not affected by which vectors you can get. It just says how many ways can you get them. And in this case, there's only if there is a solution, there's only one of them. Now, just notice the types of matrices that we used. They were different sizes, and they weren't square specifically. And that allows us to make some observations. Well, first off, let's make some observations about where the pivot positions were at. Okay? So, a mapping's on to if when you row reduce it, there's a pivot point in every row of the matrix, obviously. All right, if there's a pivot point in every row, that means we can find a solution. If we can find a solution for every B, it's on to. As far as one to one goes, well, one to one means there can't be multiple ways of getting to the same vectors. And so if there's no multiple ways of getting to the same vectors, that means there's no free variables in our associated matrix. So hopefully that makes sense. On to means there's a pivot point in each row. That's what we showed through that first example. The second example, that last row did not have a pivot point, and therefore it was not on to. As far as one to one goes, um, in the first case, we had a free variable, so we were not one to one. In our second case, there were no free variables, so it was one to one. So what I'd like you to do here is determine if this matrix is one to one and if this matrix is on to. Now, I just said um, it slightly wrong on purpose. So technically, the transformation is one to one and on to, but sometimes we will use sort of the, in this class, the bastardized uh, language of the matrix is one to one and on to. Okay, so um, just uh, note that if I say that, what I'm saying is that the transformation associated with the associated matrix is on to or one to one. So go ahead and push pause on the video and do that. There we go. So here's what we go. Here's what we did. I'm sorry. So we take this matrix, and basically we're thinking matrix equation. So we wrote, we put that in row reduced echelon form. Now, if you do that for this matrix, you get the three by three identity matrix. So I3 is what we would call that, I sub three. And notice, we can ask, is it one-to-one? -one? All right, if you have a solution, there's only one such solution. So if we have a augmented matrix here, are there any free variables? Is there any situation in which we can get an infinitely many solutions? And the answer is no. There's no free variable columns, no free variables. So since it's no free variables, there's only one such solution 
one solution for at most for each B. All right, one solution for each B means that this transformation is one to one. Okay, so we this one is one to one. All right. Let me do that that way. Now, how about on to? So again, remember what on to means. We need a solution for every B we choose. Um, so we're asking ourselves, is there any way that we could get a no solution? The answer is no, because we have a pivot point in each row. So whatever we do over here in the augmented matrix on the right-hand column, we're going to get an x1 equals some number, x2 equals some number, x3 equals some number. And so there is no way to get a no solution. So every vector B has a solution. And therefore, this transformation is on to. All right. So every vector has a solution. And therefore, this is on to. Notice that, again, this in our previous two examples we had like a one was a one to one and the other and the on two was not and then the other way it was not one to one but it was on to in this case we have a situation where our matrix is both one to one and on two all right i want you to do one more example of that i want you to take this matrix and see if this one is one to one, and then also see if this one is on to. Push pause on the video. All right, so here's what we do. Put the matrix in your calculator, this matrix A. Put that in row reduced echelon form. What you get is 1, negative 2, 0 in the first row, 0, 0, 1 in the second row, all zeros in the third row. Okay. Now, <clears throat> first off, let's talk about 1 to 1. Could this be 1 to 1? The answer is no. This is not 1 to 1. We have free a free variable. So there is going to be an infinitely many solutions uh, situation if we can solve for B. So this we have a free variable, or this matrix has a free variable, and therefore this is this transformation is not one to one. All right, so this transformation is not one to one because we could find a free variable. One to one means there's only one solution for every solvable equation. This free variable says there's infinitely many solutions sometimes when I solve the equation. Now let me copy and paste that just so I don't have to scroll up again. Let's look at on to. On to means I can get a solution for every B I choose. Basically, this last row says that we get on all zeros. This is the this three by three matrix is not the augmented matrix, but rather the or reduced echelon form of the coefficient matrix. So if we had the augmented matrix, yes, there are cases where we would end up with a one right here. 
and therefore um, we can get no solutions. I like to say we can get a no solution situation. So there are bees that don't work. And since there are bees that don't work, the transformation is not on to. All right. So this one was not on to and not one to one. The last one we dealt with was actually both. And we've seen cases where one of them's one of those properties is a yes, one of those properties is a no. So lots of different uh, matching patterns there. Okay. So one to one and on to transformations are the last thing we we're going to do in not only section one point nine but also in chapter one. All right, that ends the material for chapter one, and this covers uh, unit one, so we'll be taking the test, uh, or you'll be taking the test shortly. All right, so we'll push pause, and then, or excuse me, we'll uh, end this video, and then after this, get into chapter two material.